West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. So how would I describe Donald Trump's speech in Arizona on Thursday? Two words, utter disaster. Let me show you some of the lowlights of Trump's speech in Arizona where he had people wait outside for him in 110 degree weather. About 50 people or so were actually hospitalized. I'll show you Trump first, then I want to compare it to President Biden in his interview with ABC where he went on the offense and he was not holding back. So here's Donald Trump in Arizona glitching. Play the clip. When I'm president, I will use Title 42 to end the trial, and we have to do this. Here's Donald Trump in Arizona kissing a corrupt sheriff. Play the clip. I don't kiss men, but I kissed him. Here's Donald Trump in Arizona cursing. Play the clip. So they come up with something that's fake, just like everything else they do. It's all fake. The impeachments are fake. The court cases are a disgrace to our country. Everything is fake. So they come up with this order. I, I won't say it because I don't like using the word bullshit in front of these beautiful children. So I won't say it. I will not say it. But this thing allows millions of people. <laughs> Here's, here's Donald Trump in Arizona praising dictators. Play the clip. When I was, when I was, when I was in China, I was with President Xi. 1.4 billion people, strong guy. And we got along well until COVID. Then I said, I said, the hell with it, man. It wasn't. What they, what they unleashed on the world was incredible. But... And just so you can see some of the footage of the uh, MAGAs who were outside in 110 degree weather who were hospitalized, let me just show you just some uh, video right there. I'll just show you a short clip. Um, but Donald Trump held this in Arizona at the peak temperature in the afternoon because Donald Trump had to rush to a billionaire's fundraiser in San Francisco. Just so you see what was going on outside of the Trump speech, it was like this. Play the clip. So we had glitching Trump, kissing Trump, cursing Trump, wannabe dictator Trump, people hospitalized, 
And here is lying Trump saying that black colleges were not funded until him. Here, play this clip. We, I funded the colleges and black colleges and universities. Nobody else did that. Nobody else even thought of it. And we're All right, so you keeping track of our list. Glitching Trump, kissing Trump, disgusting kissing Trump, cursing Trump, praising dictator Trump, people hospitalized, lying Trump, and here's just rambling Trump talking some, something about stores and air conditioning being stolen. Play the clip. They go and stop people from robbing stores. You go to some of these departments where over 500 people walk into the stores. They walk out with air conditioning. They strip the whole store. The company goes out of business. The store is vacant for 25 years. The whole city becomes a slum. And if you do anything as a law enforcement person, they take away your house, they take away your family, they take away your pension. Then Donald Trump, it's about time. He had to talk about his main platform, right? Like, look, the people are there to see what he has to say about what he can do for this country. So look, Donald Trump had to talk about his key platform, which is the fact that he was a convicted felon or that he is a convicted felon, that he was found guilty. Just think about that, folks. Donald Trump's main platform in the election is not, here's what I'm gonna do for the American people. It is, feel bad for me, a billionaire who's been found liable for sexual assault, who's been found liable for civil fraud, who's been found liable for defamation, who's bankrupted most of the companies that he's touched despite being born with a golden spoon in his mouth, and has now been convicted on 34 felony counts. That's, that's what he's running on feel bad for him because of the fact that he was convicted by a jury of his peers. Here, here he's whining, play it. I just went through a rigged trial in New York <laughs> with a highly conflicted, and I mean highly conflicted judge, where there was no crime. And then of course he's got to lean into a little bit more substance on policy, right? Like here, talking more about being convicted. Play the clip. Now it's never been, nobody's ever seen because they know it was rigged. They know it's a corrupt system. They know all about it, but with your help, less than five months from now, and we're going, and I'll tell you what, we have to change the system. We have to straighten out what's going on in these sports. We got a rigged deal going, this whole country. And we've got to do it. And those appellate courts have to step up and straighten things out or we're not going to have a country any longer. And here Donald Trump leans in and says to everybody in Arizona to support his election denying pal who won't leave Mar-a-Lago, Carrie Lake. Play the clip. You got to elect Carrie Lake. She's going to be fantastic. Carrie Lake. Carrie. Oh yeah, and Donald Trump says that there is uh, currently underway right now, an invasion taking place. The biggest invasion ever, he says, is happening right now. I'll play the clip. So this has been the largest invasion in history. We've never, we are being invaded. I'm reminded about what that sports broadcaster, Colin Coward, says. It's like, there's only a certain amount of times where you can tell me things are happening that aren't actually happening before it's like, you're the biggest con artist. I think that's an understatement by Colin Coward, but that's what Donald Trump's pitching, the biggest con ever. He just thinks if he repeats it and says it, people's view of the fact that we're doing pretty good in America right now, especially compared to other countries internationally. America's like number one in mostly all categories, whether it's the economy, whether it's things like oil production, whether it's you name it, but I let Donald Trump sell you the uh, bill of goods like the snake oil salesman uh, that he is. By the way, he's got to give a shout out to criminals from Venezuela. Play this clip. And there may be, is there any uh, criminal from Venezuela in the room? Please raise your hand. Let's... There probably is. We just don't know about it. Right. So just completely unhinged. Let me show you, though, President Biden's interview. Uh, let me show you President Biden's interview here uh, on ABC. And here, President Biden is asked about, what are you going to do in the debate? First off, this is what I think. Trump ain't debating. You saw Trump. You think Trump's going to debate someone who's like this? Play this clip. Let me ask you, as we sit here today, you're preparing to speak to the world about the fight for democracy, uh, both abroad uh, and at home. We are three weeks from this debate. What do you think you need to accomplish on that debate stage? Say what I think. 
that him say what he thinks. The things he said are off the wall. See, I want to be a dictator on day one. I want to move in a direction where he talks about, you know, suspending the Constitution. All I have to do is hear what he says, remind people what he says and what I believe and what he believes. He, he's about him. I'm about the country. You think rambling, meandering, uh, mush brain Donald Trump is going to debate President Biden? Sure, President Biden is older right now than he was. He's four years older than Donald Trump, so they're kind of right around the same age. I get that President Biden used to talk faster. I'm sure he wishes that he could, you know, be quicker on it. He, he's not, but he's deliberate. He's smart as heck. He's got a real good sense of humor, and he's very, very sharp here. He's asked a question about, you know, Donald Trump saying this and that about your executive order. He's calling you pathetic. Watch what President Biden says. Play the clip. You bring up your opponent, Donald Trump. He has said of your executive action, he's pretending to finally do something about the border, but it's all about show. He says we have a debate coming up. Biden's executive order is weak and pathetic. Is he describing himself? Weak and pathetic? <laughs> Come on. Look, everybody knows what's happened. We had a deal. It was much broader than this, much better, much more accepted across the board. And he got on the phone and told the Republicans, don't support it. And here, President Biden says, I don't know. let the American people decide what they think about Trump's convention, okay? What I care about is the rule of law. Here, play the clip. You did address Donald Trump and the guilty verdict on 34 felony counts before the American people. You told Americans to respect the jury and the outcome of this case. You were at a campaign fundraiser uh, and you told the room a convicted felon is now seeking the office of the presidency. You called it disturbing. What do you think the American people should make of this? How important do you think this conviction should be in this race for president? That's for the public to decide. But one thing for certain is stop undermining the rule of law. Stop undermining the institutions. That's what this whole effort is. All the MAGA Republicans are coming out saying this is a fix. This was a jury that was that, that this was a, a judge that set up to get Trump. There's no evidence of any of that. None. He's trying to undermine it. Look, he got a fair trial. The jury spoke like they speak in all cases, and it should be respected. And then it's not a day that starts with the letter T if Donald Trump is not whining on his social media platform. Uh, here it is. Donald Trump goes. This is, I'm not going to show you his other posts. I'll just show you one because it's, just, it's like a, he's like a madman, crazy. He goes. It is a total and complete American tragedy that crooked Joe Biden Department of Injustice is so de desperate to jail Steve Bannon and every other Republican for that matter for not submitting to the unselect committee political thugs made up of all Democrats and two crazed former Republican lunatics crying Adam Kinzinger and Liz out of her mind changing. The nicknames are pretty poor. It has been irrefutably proven that the unselects who committed the actual crimes when they deleted and just, you can't read, this is, this is 5150 stuff here. I mean, this is truly stuff that he needs to put a straitjacket on. I mean, this is wild stuff. Okay, but you want to bring up Steve Bannon, your buddy, your conspirator, co-conspirator. Let's hear what Steve Bannon said in his own words when he attended an event in October 2020 hosted by Miles Guo, who's now been charged as well for a billion dollar fraud. Also, in addition to Steve Bannon being found guilty by a jury in Washington, D.C. in a federal proceeding, Steve Bannon is being tried in New York after you pardoned him for the federal crimes it was alleged he committed for the We Build the Wall scam where it's alleged he stole money from donors who thought the money was going to build the wall that you didn't build. But here is Bannon at Miles Guo's compound. Remember, Guo is now under indictment, under he's been arrested. Um, and But at this period of time, Bannon's like, no matter what the results are, here's our plan. We're going to claim victory no matter what happens. Donald Trump's going to say that he won even if he's losing. That's our plan. 
That's why the January 6th committee wanted to hear from him, not the unselect committee or this or that. At the end of the day, what he's saying here is so fundamentally against what our country stands for. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent. It's only the MAGA mush wannabe fascist brain show up with long red ties where Donald Trump dresses you up with his face on your shirt and all the weirdness that's now become the Republican Party. If you're a mainstream Republican, a mainstream conservative, an independent or a Democrat, what I'm about to play you right now should piss you off. This is not the rule of law. This is not what our system is about. This is pathetic. Play this clip. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. That quote came to mind last week when audio from Trump advisor Steve Bannon surfaced from October 31st, 2020, just a few days before the presidential election. Let's listen. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. It, but it, that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. Theirs vote in May. And so they're going to have a natural disadvantage and Trump's going to take advantage of it. That's our strategy. He's going to declare himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's going to be a firestorm. <laughs> also, also if, Trump <laughs> is, if Trump is losing by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, it's going to be even crazier. <laughs> you know, no, because he's going to sit right there and say they stole it. If Biden's winning, Trump is going to do some crazy shit. And of course, four days later, President Trump declared victory when his own campaign advisors told him he had absolutely no basis to do so. What the new Steve Bannon audio demonstrates is that Donald Trump's plan to falsely claim victory in 2020, no matter what the facts actually were, was premeditated. Perhaps worse, Donald Trump believed he could convince his voters to buy it, whether he had any actual evidence of fraud or not. It is Friday, the 7th of June of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little Yorkie is a little bit under the weather, and we're taking a good look at her and giving her a little rest. So we will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Well, yes, Little Precious is, has been under the weather for about a week or a little bit longer, possibly. She had uh, knee surgery, of course, uh, a bit ago, and uh, so she's been had been prescribed uh, Meloxidil, which is an analgesic uh, for pain. And uh, I asked the vet, uh, you know, they gave me a, not a large bottle, but it wasn't small. And they said it could, to continue. And I looked at some of the side effects and part of it is listlessness. Uh, the, the groomer said she had a, a I'm sorry, bear with me. I know it's morning for some of you some somewhere in the world. Regardless, uh, she had a little bit of blood in her stool. And uh, so, uh, yeah, she's not her perky self. A bit concerning. So I took her off the meloxidil uh, because I don't think... <laughs> Will it reverse what's already happened? I don't know, but I'm not going to worsen it. And uh, unfortunately, the vets are cl the vet is closed on Fridays, so we'll get a hold of them on Monday or leave a message, and hopefully they get back to us and uh, the royal us, as in the royal we, and uh, go from there. So. Yeah, eek. <laughs> I'm hoping her I'm hoping her liver wasn't damaged. One always worries about that. <laughs> yep. Anyway, uh she's resting right now. Uh she seems okay. I think a little bit later on in the morning, if I get the car keys out, she's gonna bounce up and want to go for a ride. So that's always a test. Um 
when Gunner decides that he wants to, well, bark at the neighborhood dogs walking by on a leash, run back and forth along the uh, perimeter of the property. I like that perimeter of the property. Uh, he gets good exercise doing that, I got to tell you. Uh, she'll, she'll chime in and bark, and uh, sometimes we'll actually, uh, you know, go to the door. She's never really was one to actually chase like Gunner likes to because he's pretty big, so she's smart not to do that. But uh, she'll chime in, and that's another test about, because uh, she was doing that yesterday, So, but she seemed a little tired this morning, but she seems a little tired these last few mornings, several mornings. Okay, well, uh, I don't know why I decided to go off on the dogs, but hey, they're our friends and family, too. All righty. So uh, it's Friday, means we're headed into the weekend, and we're going to get a lot of BS from you-know-who. Boy, boy, it, I... <laughs> If you hear it from Magaland out here, um, Joe is the most incompetent, uh, senile, uh, crooked. Joe is crooked. Okay. I guess, you know, if if you're a crook, <laughs> a good guy like Joe's going to be crooked. I usually thought that's how it worked, you know. A good person to a crook is a crook. They got to be. Anyway, uh, I had a bit of a disheartening experience. I uh, drove out to the the uh, honey house, little place, little farm. Has honey and baked goods and all sorts of stuff, neat stuff. Anyway, uh, on the drive out there, it's in, you know, farmland. And there were a lot of Trump signs, Trump 24. Uh, it, now, this is not on the day he was, you know, indicted, or not indicted, but but uh, ruled to be a felon. But uh, I was wondering if maybe, because uh, I saw a lot of signs closer to my neighborhood go up the day of. So I just figured it's, you know, a coordinated thing, the Republican Party, or as I like to call it, the MAGA Nazi Party, MAGA Nazi, uh, are very well coordinated. They, they goose up right on time. Uh, but I'm also heart knowing that there's a lot of people, me included, that are not going to advertise that we're for Joe and Kamala. Kamala. <laughs> what did I just say? We're not that we're not going to advertise that because uh, probably not a good idea in terms of, you know, property, life, and limb. Yep. That's how it is. They like to terrorize, but yeah, well, it's not my first rodeo. I had tires slashed, car fire bombed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, when I was 19 because I wanted to impeach Nixon. How dare I? It's not even like I was impeaching him. I was just advocating that someone who was competent would, and they did. Well, they started to. And then he bugged out, okay? Then he could go on, uh, you know, TV. And tell everybody, oh, yeah, well, you know, when the president does it, it's it's not a crime. Easy for him to say. And they've been trying to get back on us ever since. It's no it's no coincidence that Roger Stone has Nixon tattooed. I, I think it's on his right shoulder, right back behind on the, you know, like, right there, like on the shoulder blade area. Nixon, standing over his right shoulder. Yikes. Okay, well, you know, some people call it a cult. Some people call it a cult of personality. Some people call it weird, and I, it's all of that. I don't know. I 
it's just never I I never wanted to be in a cult. I had friends that were in them. And uh, you know, they were still friends. Okay? That was when I was young and naive and thought doesn't matter if people disagree with each other. We we can still be friends. Yeah, well, sometimes you can't. Anyway, um yeah, so I, I, I can see the allure, you know, especially if there's cute girls in saffron robes and patchouli oil. Yeah. Were those cults? I don't know. They were groups. Some people called them communes. Yeah, that's right, a commune. <sighs> well, a bunch of people are communing. Other people have to do the work. That's usually how it works. It does in any society. Okay. Some people are communing. A bunch of other people are doing the work. And then we'll call it paradise. Paradise for some. <laughs> yeah, you know. I always thought about the service staff that had to like attend to Adam and Eve. Jeez. My God, you never hear about them. I mean, come on. How did this entitled couple ever? ever survive in paradise. Jesus H, you know what? Oh, that came later in the story. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent. If I was being blasphemous and sacrilegious, um, I can literally say I was only joking. <laughs> yes, I was. I was only joking. <laughs> oh boy. It's Friday. And, um, yeah, life is different with mom being gone. My, my, I almost have too much time on my hands, sort of. Actually, I'm quite busy. And uh, I've decided to uh, take on some tasks that I had put off in terms of literary endeavors and whatnot. Because sometimes uh, the kind of literary endeavors that I endeavor into take concentration, focus, and... Sometimes days, if not weeks, of, you know, being honed in. And, uh, but I, I, I couldn't allow myself to do that when I had to care for mom. So I tried to do a little time thing. But when you're caring for someone, you know, they, their needs and whatnot are not constrained to a particular time. Okay. Like, you can only complain from this hour to this hour. Or within this 20-minute block, in this time, th 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 then we can do something. That's not how it works. You know, so there's no way to time manage that. So I made allowances. and uh, But I got to say, I kind of miss caring for her. I mean, I don't know. who wouldn't, you know, because it means your mom's alive. Your loved one is still alive. Oh, well, she was slowing down. And that's sort of like what I'm noticing with little precious, too. Uh, I even mentioned it with uh, the groomer, Morgan, that it seems like she got old really quick. And she's not that old. I think she's only like five, six, seven, somewhere around there. I got to check again. But, uh, yeah, life, life, isn't that a weird thing? We, you know, we are sort of constricted to a certain parameter of time. Lucky us, boy, of all the immensity of the universe, of all the manipulation of time, space, matter, <laughs> mass and velocity, uh, we're here. So I guess we get to feel lucky for however short it is in the immensity of all that. Okay, well, since we are here and uh, we had a big, long opening that we've been doing lately because thank you for bearing with me. And uh, now I've just been ranting on as if it's a Friday. 
<laughs> because it is, why don't we give you a rundown on what we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. The only black lead doctor in the NFL has filed suit alleging racial discrimination. Uh-huh. An appeals court ruled eight books dealing with racism and transgender issues must be returned to library shelves in a rural Texas county that had removed them. Yeah, we'll see how that works. And Eugene Meyer, the longtime president of the Federalist Society, announced his retirement. They're looking, they actually have a head on their company looking for another CEO. And, uh, but it uh, looks like, uh, Leonard Leo is going to retain his title as co-director. All righty. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the United States imposed sanctions on dozens of Georgian officials in response to the enactment of a law that will curb media freedom. And we're talking about the country, not the state. Confused you, didn't it? Yes, it did. And... A French citizen was arrested in Moscow on charges of collecting military data. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. We're going to tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we'll pick up particulars next week. How about that? Okay. And it is by Brooke Lee Howard from the newly magatized Daily Beast. So it hasn't uh, filtered down too much yet. We'll see. The only black head doctor... Uh, in the NFL, is suing his former employees. He's a head team doctor. And his former employers, the uh, Atlanta Falcons and Emory University, he's suing them for racial discrimination and retaliation. Dr. Br- Brandon Mines has also listed his former supervisors, Dr. Kenneth Mountner and Dr. Scott Bolden, in the lawsuit. In a June 1st complaint, Mines claimed his rights had been violated after he was fired from the Falcons. He accused the team and Emory of retaliating against him by withholding his wages and spreading false statements about him, including that he allegedly failed to maintain player medical rights records, and that he missed a brain tumor in one of the Atlanta Falcon players. The termination stifled Mine's promising career trajectory and eroded trust within the sports medicine community at Emory. And that's stated in the lawsuit. It continued the ripple effects of this unlawful termination are far-reaching, casting doubt over Emory's and the Falcons' commitment to diversity and inclusivity and creating a culture of uncertainty and fear among its black physicians. Mines began working with Emory in 2005 and had every intention to remain with Emory until his retirement. That's in the lawsuit. Simultaneously, he started working with the Falcons in 2011 and was promoted to be the uh, the side's head medical physician in 2014. In 2019, Mine signed a multi-year contract with Emory University that partnered with the Falcons. Over the years, Mines went for new promotions, but according to the lawsuit, he was passed over for roles that instead went to white colleagues who were not as qualified. 
Mines also applied for positions with the Atlanta Braves Major League Baseball team, which was contracted with Emory as well as the Atlantic Hawks NBA side. But the complaint claims that his bosses, Bowden and Mountner, both of whom are white, seem to seem to prefer white doctors. Mines also brainstormed new ideas at Emory and said he would be interested in leading them. Bowden and Mountner acknowledged they were good ideas, but nothing ever came of them. Specifically, Mines showed interest in becoming the co-director of sports medicine, but never got a direct answer from his supervisors. In a annual job review in 2023, Mimes officially put his employers on notice and complained about always being overlooked. Kevin McGill at the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Eight books dealing with subjects including racism and transgender issues must be returned to library shelves in a rural Texas county that had removed them in an ongoing book banning controversy. A divided panel of three federal appeals court judges ruled yesterday Thursday. Thursday. It was a partial victory for seven library patrons who sued numerous officials with the Lano County Library System and the county government after 17 books were removed. In Thursday's opinion from a three-judge panel of the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans, New Orleans. One judge voted to uphold a lower court order that the book should be returned. Another largely agreed but said nine of the books could stay off the shelves as the appeal plays out. A third dissented entirely, meaning a majority supported returning eight books. In March of 2023... U.S. District Judge Robert Pittman ordered 17 books returned to Kingsland, Kingsland library shelves while a citizen lawsuit against book banning proceeded. The works ranged from children's books to award-winning nonfiction, including they called themselves the KKK, the birth of an American terrorist group by Susan Campbell Bartoletti, and is perfectly normal. Changing Bodies, Growing Up, Sex and Sexual Health by Robbie Harris. The ruling from Pittman, nominated to the federal court by former President Barack Obama, was on hold during the appeal. Yesterday's ruling was a preliminary injunction and more court proceedings are likely. The opinion, or the main opinion, was by Judge Jacques Wiener, nominated to the court by former President H.W. Bush, Wiener said the books were clearly removed at the past of county officials who disagreed with the book's messages. But a book may not be removed for the sole or substantial reason that the decision maker does not wish patrons to be able to access the book's viewpoint or message, Wiener wrote. Judge Leslie Southwick, a nominee of former President George W. Bush, agreed partially. He argued that some of the removals might stand a court test as the case progresses, noting that some of the books dealt more with juvenile, flatulent humor than weightier subjects. And Judge Stuart Kyle Duncan, a nominee of former President Donald Trump, dissented fully. The commission, hanging in my office, says judge, not librarian. Duncan wrote, imagine my surprise then to learn that my two esteemed colleagues have appointed themselves co-chairs of every public library across the Fifth Circuit. Well, we know who the book burner is, don't we?
Julianne Levine and Ozzy Pabara of the magnetized Washington Poo Poo. That's what I call it, the Washington Poo Poo. Brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. The Federalist Society, the conservative legal group that helped Trump cement a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, is looking for a new president and CEO after his longtime leader announced he would retire. In an email to supporters obtained by the Washington Post, Federalist Society President Eugene Meyer told reporters yesterday, Thursday, that he remains in good health but wants to begin the search for a successor while that is the case. So we can do this search expeditiously and carefully, but without undue pressure. This would also allow time for a smooth transition. According to FedSoc co-chair Leonard Leo, the change in leadership is not expected to alter the direction of the 42-year-old organization. No, I think it means it's going to be cemented into their goose-stepping rightward march to you-know-what. Leo said the group's new leader needs to be somebody who can lead the conservative legal movement and continue to promote the organization as a very important thought leader about our Constitution and the rule of law. Yeah, we know about your rule of law. The Federalist Society has had a hand in backing all six of the sitting conservative judges, starting with John Roberts, but it was during the Trump administration that the group's influence grew, with Leo acting as Trump's unofficial judicial advisor to pack the courts with judges who take what the group views as an originalist approach to interpreting the Constitution when it suits them. Let's not forget that. Well, that brings us to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. NetworksRadio.com Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Q&A, Bait and Switch. So Anya Taylor-Joy is interesting casting for the title character of Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. She has a lightness to her, even without having starved herself. So different from Charlize Theron, who originated the character in Mad Max Fury Road. It's the difference between, oh awesome, it's Anya Taylor-Joy, and holy crap, that's Charlize Theron. So I wondered why Taylor-Joy for this post-apocalyptic mayhem? And also, why do we keep making these movies? I already know that every time I turn on my car, I'm driving our great-grandparents' nails further into our grandkids' coffins. And then I thought... You know how director George Miller and his writing partner Nick Nathuris gave us a bait and switch with Mad Max Fury Road, which you should certainly watch before seeing this film. Here's Tom Hardy, and we think we're going to get another Mad Max throwdown, but then Fury Road turns out to be all about Theron and Furiosa liberating a Morton Joe's harem of wives, a film that spoke directly to our times, and as proof, all the misogynist bro boys were all up at arms yelling, bleep this PC me too bull bleep, get these bleeps out of our car and truck testosterone desert death orgy. Well, in the same way, Furiosa a Mad Max saga is not a Furiosa origin story, even though she and it are both there. What Miller and crew have really made is an epic war movie. Sadly, again, a film for our time. And the actual lead is the latest new character to steal Miller's show, Dementis, played by Chris Hemsworth. And you don't need the gravitas of a Theron Furiosa getting in the way of that. Especially as the brilliance of Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, and saga is the right word, is that this whole carnival of carnage comes down to one still scene at the end, which is mostly a Hemsworth speech, where I think Miller and Lothuris answer why we keep ending up here. See it. They're not feel-good answers, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. This has been Take to Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeToMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube.
Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Trump team hits apprentice film with cease and desist letter. I'm Bill Newman. This is the Civil Liberties Minute. And under that headline, this story. The docudrama The Apprentice, which just premiered at the Cannes Film Festival, depicts Trump during the 1970s and 80s. Trump's lawyer accused the filmmaker of creating a concoction of political lies that defame the former president and constitute election interference. Part of Trump's defamation claim involves the allegation that Trump sexually assaulted his first wife, Ivana, an allegation Trump has denied. Ivana Trump made that allegation, but later recanted it, saying she felt violated, but nothing criminal occurred. Some of Trump's legal hurdles? Movies are protected by the First Amendment. And statements about public figures are not libelous unless a falsehood is published with knowledge that it's false or with reckless disregard for whether it's true or not, what the law calls actual malice. That's an intentionally high standard established by the Supreme Court 60 years ago in a case where supporters of Martin Luther King placed an ad in the New York Times criticizing the Montgomery, Alabama police for their treatment of civil rights protesters. A free press depends on creators of content being free to report on the powerful without fear of lawsuits and bankruptcy. A lower standard would chill freedom of the press and constitute a threat to all of us. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. Ohio has an August 7th deadline for November's candidate registration. Problem is, Joe Biden wasn't going to be nominated until the Democratic convention beginning August 19th. What's an Ohio legislature to do? Try and stop ballot initiatives, of course. State legislatures routinely pass housekeeping bills to accommodate such discrepancies, but not this year. The legislative majority was spanked by the voters in 2023 after the legislature backed changes to ballot measure rules in August, trying to derail a reproductive rights initiative in November. The Ohio Capital Journal reports that negotiations for the fix began in early May, passing a House committee. Seeing a partisan opportunity, extreme Republican Senate leaders rolled in SB 215, a bill expanding a ban on foreign contributions to ballot measures to include foreign nationals living and working in the U.S. The Associated Press reports that a group funding the November Reproductive Rights Campaign received donations from a legal U.S. resident, Swiss billionaire Hans-Jörg Weiss. When National Democrats organized a pre-convention online nomination instead and DeWine berated his fellow Republicans, Senate leadership offered to pass the fix, if the foreign funder legislation passed too. In a special legislative session, both the fix and the ban were passed and signed by the governor. Find more on this unnecessary drama at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1912. That was the day Boston Carmen of Local 589 voted to strike. Workers had been fighting to organize for years. They now demanded union recognition. In the months before the strike, union representatives had attempted to meet with management with no success. The president of the L in the days before it was called the T went so far as to summarily fire 282 employees claiming the need to maintain discipline. Incensed at the union-busting maneuver, workers walked off the job in the early hours of the morning. They began cutting trolley ropes, smashing train windows, and removing handles on controller boxes. In an effort to bust the strike, management formed a company union. They also brought in over 700 professional strike breakers and provided housing for the scabs. Over the course of several weeks, dozens of strikers were arrested on charges that ranged from calling strike breakers scabs to trumped up felony charges. A 
NFL President Samuel Gompers visited the picket line in a show of solidarity. Area labor unions provided financial and legal support. The union filed charges with the State Board of Arbitration. They argued management had caused the strike by firing hundreds of workers for union activity and coercing workers against joining the union. Once the board confirmed the union's charges, the governor and mayor both pushed for resolution. As well, Boston's Central Labor Union threatened a general strike. Union recognition finally came on July 28th, and the first contract was signed a year later. Since that time, Local 589 has weathered more than a century of anti-union storms as it continues to fight for better wages, hours, and conditions. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 60 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs around 95, which means it's probably going to be closer to 100. Oh, my God. Sunny conditions throughout the day with winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. A few passing clouds tonight with lows near 60. Need it to be a tad cooler, I think. Winds will be out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then intervals of clouds and sunshine tomorrow with highs in the upper 80s. So, oh, a cooling trend, eh? Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Grass pollen remains very high here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range and has come down quite a bit to 18 parts per million. It was in the 30s yesterday. And the daytime UV index remains very high at level 9, so slather on the SPF, please. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.91 inches. Visibility is up to 9 miles, and relative humidity is at 69%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 66 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 72 and sunny. Rome is 87 and sunny. Kabul is 63 and fair. Hong Kong is 78 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 68 and clear. Melbourne, Australia is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and mostly cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is 72 and sunny with a small craft advisory. And New York, New York is 78 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche. 
Here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. The United States imposed sanctions yesterday Thursday on dozens of Georgian officials in response to the enactment of a law that drew weeks of protest by critics who say it will curb media freedom and jeopardize the country's chances of joining the European Union. The move to impose travel bans on the officials, members of the ruling Georgian Dream Party, law enforcement officers, lawmakers, private citizens, and family members came three days after Georgia's parliament speaker signed the measure into law following lawmakers' override of a presidential veto. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller did not identify those targeted due to visa confidentiality laws, but said a few dozen people were cited for anti-democratic activity. Secretary of State <clears throat> Antony Blinken had warned about such a move after Parliament's initial passage of the bill last month. He also said the U.S. was reviewing all its assistance to Georgia, which, which has amounted to $390 million over the past several years. On Monday, Parliament Speaker Shalva Papashuvili signed the legislation sealing the override of a veto of the bill by President Salome Zorabachivli. The measure requires media, non-governmental organizations, and other non-profit groups to register as pursuing the interests of a foreign power if they receive more than 20% of their funding from abroad. The government argued the law is needed to stem what it deems to be harmful foreign actors trying to destabilize the South Caucasus nation of 3.7 million. Many journalists and activists say its true goal is to stigmatize them and restrict debate before the parliamentary election scheduled for October. Opponents have denounced it as the Russian law because it resembles measures pushed through by the Kremlin to crack down on independent news media, nonprofits, and activists. They say the measure may have been driven by Moscow to thwart Georgia's chances of further integration with the West. desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russia's top state criminal investigation agency yesterday, Thursday, announced the arrest of a French citizen accused of collecting information on military issues, a move that comes as relations between Russia and France have grown increasingly tense over the fighting in Ukraine. The arrest was announced just as France hosted world leaders on the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Russia was not invited. Russia's investigative committee said the suspect, whom it did not identify, is accused of failing to register with authorities as a foreign agent while collecting information about military and military technical activities of the Russian Federation. It added that the information could be used to the detriment of the country's security. The state news agency TASS identified the arrested French citizen as Laurent Venetier, an employee of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, a Geneva-based non-government organization. HD confirmed Venetier's detention in a statement released to the AP. 
We are, event, are aware that Laurent, an advisor at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, had been detained in Russia, it said. We are working to get more details of the circumstances and secure Laurent's release. French President Emmanuel Macron told French television last night that the French citizen was in no way working for France <clears throat> and that he works for a Swiss NGO founded by former UN Chief Kofi Annan and eh, that carries out diplomacy of working discussions. <clears throat> but he is receiving consular protection, Macron said. Well, as my, uh, as my voice is starting to deteriorate rapidly... That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know that Roots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here on Monday for River City Hash Monday. So do stay tuned to Net Roots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver